All right. So uh, I think everybody can see my, my slide deck here. Can you hear me okay? All right. So uh, the title of this is uh, Service Levy Objectives, Air Budgets for Katrina, Michael, and Ida. Uh, I wanted to keep the subtitle fairly short there. Uh, essentially what this is, is air budgeting lessons learned um, from, you know, being a veteran of, of several uh, relatively, you know, uh, catastrophic storms. Um, and so, you know, as always, the context is, right, Louisiana is very prone to flooding, um, but the slosh model used by uh, National Weather Service is only reliable uh, under very certain circumstances, and it does not do a, it was never intended to be used as a general purpose inundation model. Um, so SLOSH stands for uh, sea low-lying and ocean uh, storm surge uh, for hurricanes. Um, so the big problem with SLOSH is that given impervious surfaces uh, in, on, in a terrain model, SLOSH becomes less and less accurate. Um, so what am I measuring, you know, kind of what am I talking about measuring here? I'm talking about inundation levels uh, from surface water and from river exceedances in this specific talk. So I'm not talking necessarily about storm surge and how to model storm surge. Uh, that's a much more complicated thing. Uh, so what am I actually calculating? I'm calculating a very fast and dirty, right? This is not a well-refined uh, thing, but it's an air budget-like value. Um, and the assumption that is critical is that uh, for the methodology that I use is that you have a very well known exceedance delay value. So that's time to flood. Uh, so if you know where you're measuring uh, your core metrics, you need to know the amount of time it's going to take for your exceedance event to move from that geospatial location to the geospatial location that your error budget is calculated for, right? So these, these inundation budgets are very, very specific to a very precise, very accurate geo, geospatial location. So you can't take this data and apply it both to my farm and to a place five miles away because the inundation budget will be very different uh, because this is essentially a geospatial issue. Um, so, right, I'm going to start off with what everybody likes to see in these types of things is the disaster photos, right? So this is what we don't want to happen. We want, this is in a, in a major exceedance event. Um, what you're looking at is you're going to get uh, a significant flood impact to a specific geospatial location that you're concerned about. Uh, the problem is, is that the raw metrics don't mean anything. Uh, you need those metrics have to be in context with what you can tolerate. And so if you only make decisions based on raw metrics, you have no context and you wind up with a situation where you have, you have a flood impact uh, before you are able to calculate and figure out what, does, what do the raw metrics mean for me, right? And so to tie this like to a technology instance, this is like getting a, an alarm from a monitoring system after something is already broken, right? There's no point in me saying it's going to flood after you have water in your house, right? That doesn't help me. Your, your, prop, your, your things are going to be ruined. You're going to, you know, people are going to be stranded. They're going to need to be rescued in high water vehicles or through, you know, uh, other methods. So alerting once the flood has impacted a location doesn't help us in any way. So this, this house, uh, for context, this is my farmhouse. It actually no longer exists. After this exceedance event, uh, I tore it down, just bulldozed it because it was a total, total wreck. And now that's just a place where my happy cows live. Um, so this is my parents' house on the farm. So, um, you know, this is a significant uh, flood impact. Uh, this was taken midway through the flood. So the water came up about another two and a half feet after this photo was taken. And so 
even if we don't alert at the maximum uh, impact of the flood, even if we can alert before we reach a maximum river crest, it still doesn't do anything for us, right? And so again, the raw metric of looking at a river gauge and saying, right, or measuring water at the location and saying, there's three feet of water here, we need to panic, is too late. Um, so this is, right, like when you have an incident like this happens, this is what you're left with, right? Like you're, you are trying to run some type of operation uh, and you have in a severely degraded state. So instead of being able to move things around in a pickup truck or in a tractor or, you know, do whatever you need to do, you're now reduced to, you know, modes of transportation being some type of off-road vehicle or high water vehicle, boats, canoes, p rows, right? So like now, for my family, when they experience one of these events, they are in a severely degraded operational state. And that's what we are trying to avoid. So we're, we can't avoid the flood, right? Like if there's an exceedance event that's gonna have a flood impact, we can't solve for that because we have no way to control you know, the, the millions of variables uh, and factors involved in that occurring. What we can solve for is when do we start certain operational measures to ensure that everybody's safe, that belongings are, are, are moved while we can still move them with trucks and tractors and trailers, and we're not trying to move people and belongings with boats and canoes. So why does this happen? And, and I think this is a, a really interesting question, uh, right? It happens all the time in Louisiana, right? And so, uh, there's a lot of variables in play, but like also last night, this is happening in Brooklyn, right? Like the remnants of Ida have traversed, you know, the continent and have now started impacting and causing exceedance events um, in, you know, in New York City. So it's not that, oh, you live close to the coast, you're going to experience exceedance events. Um, it's a much more nuanced thing. And so Louisiana has a very unique terrain model compared to most other places, you know, that are prone to inundations. And so in Florida, you know, you think of, oh, it floods in Florida when you have a hurricane. You know, Florida has a coastline that is primarily composed of beaches and estuaries. Um, and those types of, you don't have giant Florida uh, cities uh, that go all the way to the coast and the giant Florida cities that do sit on the coast they have beaches. Um, and so beaches, uh, that is a totally different terrain model and it impacts inundation models in a very different way than what Louisiana has. Louisiana has marshes, um, which they hold a lot of water um, almost all the time. And that, uh, that impacts an inundation model uh, in a very significant way. And so the thing that makes the biggest impact in inundation is your impervious surface. So I did my graduate work on researching impervious surface uh, impacts on, on flooding and inundation. And so in, an impervious surface is any uh, surface in your, ter in your terrain model that does not allow water to move through it and into the water table. Um, and so if you think about the impervious surface in Louisiana, so the concrete, roofs on houses, roads, asphalt, all of those things, those are all impervious surfaces. Water is also an impervious surface. And so the Louisiana terrain model along the coast is almost all water, right? It might be an inch deep in the marsh, but it's still water. And so when you have the introduction of new surface water, um, you know, through like a rain event, or you have an inundation like a coastal uh, storm surge event, that water can't it doesn't seep through the other water and go into the water table. It stacks up on itself and, and moves inward. Uh, so how is this different from somewhere like Florida? Um, you know, Florida has the beaches. So, you know, it, some context here, right? I have gone through Katrina. I've gone through Hurricane Michael and that destroyed Tyndall Air Force Base. And now I've, you know, I didn't go through Ida personally. Uh, I was here in San Antonio, uh, basically running, uh, trying to build something that would uh, communicate with my family so that they could know when to 
engage in their operational activities and preparations for flood. And so if you look at, at Tyndall, Tyndall has, um, it has a beach right next to it, but then it has a lot of impervious surface, right? So like there are a lot of runways, there are a lot of roads, there are a lot of buildings on an Air Force base, not a lot of permeable surfaces for water to move into the water table. And so you wind up with things like this, where you, know, you have a big surge, uh, big inundation movement. It picks things up because the water has nowhere else to go and it puts them in places where they shouldn't be. Um, after it moves across the beach and all of the dunes, it's gonna hit impervious surfaces on the base. Um, if we look at what's behind the base, it's another body of water. Water is an impervious surface. Um, so that water continues to move. <clears throat> so this is a, a inundation impact study that I did for uh, Tyndall Air Force Base. And so uh, you can see kind of the, the grading, uh, you know, I created some, um, some polygon features here and, you know, uh, graded some scores. What Tyndall did have working in its favor is that it had dunes on its beaches and sand is a movable object. So when water hits sand, some of the force of the water moving itself is transferred to that, uh, the loose aggregate in the sand. And so uh, sand dunes provide a really, while not necessarily, uh, Tyndall does have a lot of impervious surface. The sand dunes can absorb the shock of an inundation event and slow down an inundation. So, why the heck are you talking about inundations this much? So going back to that slosh model, the slosh model is not really super accurate, right? So this is a slosh model uh, flood um, uh, prediction, right? A probabilistic uh, model used to generate and figure out who is going to be impacted by an inundation. And so the little yellow dot here in the middle of the screen, that's, that was my house uh, you can see I'm really close to the bay. The slosh model said, you know, that greenish, bluish band there uh, represented about six feet of storm surge. So as we see, Michael is bearing down on Panama City. You know, I checked the model and it says there's going to be six feet of storm surge in your house. So, you know, the first thing it did is pack up the wife and kids and we leave. After I, uh, after I left and we got to somewhere where we were safe, I started count doing my own calculations given the, um, the inundation impact that the terrain model for Tyndall is going to have. Um, Pager Duty is trying to call me because something's broken. Um, so I ran my own model and uh, kind of started to create what I felt like are inundation budgets of like, how much is going to probabilistically happen given new information being fed into a model and how much can I withstand? Uh, so my, my little brother is a surveyor, so I have access to very, very precise uh, geospatial equipment. So I can measure, right, the elevation of, of my home uh, to within, you know, sub-centimeter accuracy. So I can know very, very precisely the elevation of the slab of my house in Florida. Um, so I ran my own models and I thought, okay, I might get a foot of water in my yard at my base elevation, but I know I have a 18 inch slab. So I think my house is probably gonna actually be safe from storm surge. Whereas the slosh model says, um, hey, you're gonna get six feet of water right here. So the model, right, there's inaccuracy in that model and again, with that base metric, we can't really trust it because if we trust that, right, we're probably wet before uh, we can do anything. So I thought, okay, it's a good thing that I probably didn't try and load up all my furniture. I don't think everything's going to get wet. I'm more concerned about the wind event that's going to happen. So, you know, uh, we left. So as you can see now, here's a picture on the right of me standing on my street and looking uh, at what happened on my street, this is probably two weeks after uh, Hurricane Michael, we didn't get storm surge, right? So my, 
my predictive model was more accurate than the slosh model uh, because it took into account what my toleration was. Excuse me, one minute. I had to tell Pager Duty to chill out. Um, right, my I knew what my tolerance was, and I could build my model based on what I knew I could tolerate, and then also give my model additional information to do those calculations, right? And it's like, I know well, I'm going to be close. I wasn't perfectly right, but I was a lot, I was a lot closer to what actually happened in the slosh model. You know, the neighborhood is still absolutely destroyed. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a catastrophic event, uh, tons of destruction, but we didn't get an inundation. So that, this was one of the first times that I thought, okay, I'm on to something with uh, an inundation budget and understanding how much inundation I can tolerate and then providing as much information to the model that I use um, to make a pretty well-educated guess of, you know, what type of danger am I in here? Um, so now for, you know, much more current stuff. Uh, so this is an inundation model from NOAA and the National Weather Service, uh, specifically for Hurricane Ida. And so we're looking at like what's at risk. And so the yellow stuff there, that is three to six feet predicted inundation. Um, so Ida came on shore, the red dot is where my family lives. Um, so I'm looking at this model and I'm thinking, okay, we're gonna be right on the cusp of a, of a storm surge inundation event you know, I, I don't think I'm gonna, I don't think we're at danger from that event because I know that we are in danger from another inundation event based on the historical data that I have from Hurricane Katrina and from the 2016 river floods. Um, and so, right, a river flood is very different from a storm surge inundation. They're both inundation events. They, ha <clears throat> they happen in very different ways. And we have very different data sets uh, to, to base our calculations off on. So this is a, a representation of what you get from NOAA and National Weather Service. And this is basically a raw metric for the level of water and the amount of flow uh, cubic feet per second um, at a very specific geospatial location on a river. And so this is not really meaningful unless you have a lot of historical context and you know what your toleration budget is. And so I had the benefit of knowing what my toleration budgets are because we flooded a bunch of times in the past. I can look at these metrics, but I need to calculate uh, what those toleration budgets actually are. Um, and then they're using one metric is probably not gonna tell me what I need to know. So I need to string together uh, and calculate uh, impacts impact uh, coefficients for a variation of geospatial locations. So if we go back and we look at this, right, this big lake here, this is like Pontchartrain. I know that when I have a storm surge inundation, it's going to push a bunch of water into that lake. And so the surrounding rivers and, and bayous are not able to move water down. So right, this map extends far north into Mississippi. Right. If Mississippi gets a lot of rain, that rain is going to end up in those rivers and it's all going to drain down here towards the coast. If there's a bunch of water holding in the swamp and in the lake after a storm surge event, that water has nowhere to go. I know, hey, we are very, very likely to see a river exceedance event. And that's really what is really destructive for that red dot where my family lives. Right. So we know that we're not going to get hit with the storm surge right away. It's if the water stays in the lake and then the river, the water in the rivers has nowhere to go, um, that's when we're going to have a problem. So, you know, I'm looking at all the, these raw metrics. They give me a rough idea of what's going to happen. I have some historical context, but what I really want is something that's actionable for me and actionable for my family. Because like I said, I don't need to know that it's going to flood once the water already gets to my parents' house. Right, because at that point, now we're working on moving people and animals and belongings around in a boat, and that's very, very inefficient. So what I want to do is 
I want to, I want a way to go out and get all of these different data types, summarize the data in some way, um, and then kind of calculate a budget in between where the water is right now and what I can tolerate at different levels. Um, and so here's a chart. You can see two giant spikes here on this chart. This is historical data. I'm looking at 2016, uh, you know, a couple months here in 2016. And I see that like I've got one event of just over 25 feet at a particular location. I've got another event about 27 and a half feet at that same location. And so I have historical data that I can then tie to for a particular place, uh, you know, a river gauge. And then I have historical context of what happens at what stage of the flood. And as I start to put that picture together, I can start calculating, figuring out how to calculate an inundation budget for very specific locations uh, on my farm. Uh, and so, right, I, I'm not the world's greatest coder. So this is some fast and dirty Python code that I wrote to start to do a part of what I needed to do. Um, there are API calls. The uh, USGS has an API that is not well maintained. Uh, and it's very old uh, that you can make calls to to retrieve uh, geospatial data. So it's a data set that includes the geospatial data and it also includes river gauges, cubic flow per second, uh, and lots of other you know probabilistic exceedance uh, values. So this is just one of the data sites that I'm pulling. I'm pulling a uh, gauge height with with this call. Um, so, I make that call, I get a bunch of messy JSON data, I do some fast and dirty, you know, throw out what I don't need, figure out what I do need. Um, I have some, uh, some inundation values for what is my maximum tolerable amount uh, to still maintain operations. And so, right, I run my program and it comes back with an update for me. And it says that I know how much water I can tolerate on the lane that's the name of the, the the road on our farm we call it the lane so i know that i can tolerate tolerate flooding at a specific river gauge up to a certain amount and, and when i get to that mark that road is no longer passable in a passenger car then i've got a passenger uh, a pasture inundation budget so i have a, a very large cattle pasture uh, it will hold water and so i know hey when that when that pasture starts to fill up where it's non-traversable, like on an ATV, that's a, that's a big time warning sign. And I know how much time I have between that happening and, you know, water getting in a house. Um, so then I have an inundation budget for water actually entering into my parents' house, right? So whether it's, a, whether it's an inch of water or seven feet of water, I don't really care. I want to know how much toleration do I have between wherever the river's at and that mark where water's starting to come in, you know, at the base of the slab of the house. So my cousin uh, and my uncle, they have a big contracting business and a cabinet shop. Uh, you know, they probably have a couple million dollars of equipment back there. We have a, uh, our own custom sawmill uh, that we've built over the years so that we can mill our own timber for doing custom, custom work for clients. Um, I wanna know what's the toleration for water getting into that shop, right? Because we need to know very early when we see, hey, you've got essentially two and a half feet at the time that this was run um, before water starts getting in the shop. We know through historical context, that means we have about roughly two and a half to three hours before we potentially start seeing an, uh, an impact at that location. And so we know, hey, we've got three hours maximum to start moving equipment or putting equipment up on blocks so it doesn't get ruined. Um, and then, you know, my cousin's house, he's built way up off the ground. And so he has a much higher toleration, but I still wanna know how much toleration do I have back there to his house? Because if he gets to a point where he's gonna be taking water on, it's gonna take a, a, a relatively large operation uh, to go get his stuff and his people out of that that place. Um, and so this is what I'm calculating. Uh, the, the program that I wrote last weekend, it's not a super scientific, it's not a great piece of software, 
but essentially what it does, it uses an SMS, um, an SMS API because during an event like this, nobody has electricity. <clears throat> Cell service is for phone calls and mobile data is non-existent. So my cousin can't get, uh, uh, he can't get an email. He can't get uh, an application alert. Uh, the only thing that they can get somewhat reliably are text messages. So I package up, right? I do all of my data calculation. I figure out what these budgets are. And then I broadcast these to everybody in the family through uh, every 15 minutes or every 30 minutes, to, depending on where we kind of are uh, in the event. I will start broadcasting these messages out to them and saying, hey, the, you know, the pastor has, right, in this existence, we're in, we're in negative territory, so we have already breached our, our target. So the pastor now has water in it. Um, you know, the lane, we've got, you know, about a little over a foot and a half before the road is impassable. So if you need to move cars off of the lane and move them to higher ground, now's the time to do it. Uh, and so through, you know, sending SMS messages, right? Like I can't send a, a super complicated message. I'm limited by the capabilities of SMS. Uh, so I have to just try to boil it down to this very simple number. Um, what I would like to do in the future is move this system, uh, move all the data, instead of doing the calculations on the fly, start moving this data into uh, something like BigQuery, because what I end up on the backside is uh, a very simple log of, of all of my budgets. And so I just ran this a whole bunch of times the other night so that I could capture um, captured this shot here. Um, I want to move all of this data into a data source like BigQuery. That way it can be longer lived. I can do uh, some more complex summarization on the data, do some more complex statistical analysis on the data, and then be able to pipe it into something like Noble 9 uh, so that I don't have to do the calculations on my own and that you know, I can maybe go put pager duty on everybody's phone in my family. And when we start getting error budget alerts in Noble 9 or a similar product, I can send out, right? Because PagerDuty will send a text message. It will make a phone call and it will, you know, show uh, a notification from the app. So I have redundant notification methodologies through that avenue, right? I didn't have time to set up PagerDuty for my family. Uh, and I'm not there, right? A lot of my family, they're starting to get older. My parents are starting to get older. Aunts and uncles, they're not the most tech savvy. Getting them figured out how to put pager duty on their phones is a more complicated task than it should be. Um, so in the future, I'll probably do that, right? Like I'll probably, next time I go home to visit, put pager duty on everybody's phone, sign them all up, kind of run, you know, get the pager duty stuff set up move all of this, all of my historical data and all of the, the things that I've calculated so far, move them all into something like BigQuery and then wire up um, with a tool like Noble9 or, or some other SLO platform that's more fully featured than what I can build in a weekend uh, so that we can set targets like uh, not only the air budget, uh, but I would like to know the air budget burn rates for being able to calculate how fast is the water rising. That's a calculation I can do on my own. Um, I can look at volumetric uh, exceedance values and calculate a different, you know, more complex <clears throat> hydrology things. Um, I didn't have time to write code to do all of that and then summarize all of that data because I was worried about like, okay, I think we're gonna have an exceedance event and we're gonna have a significant impact. I need to be able to tell them, hey, you have, I know that, when a marker, when the gauge hits a certain level at where I'm measuring, there's about a four hour difference between the water being there and the water showing up on the farm. And so I need to be able to calculate those tolerance values and figure out, okay, hey, you're at, you know, you've got a foot and a half left of, of, of toleration for the road. Now is a really good time to start making a bunch of trips back and forth out with the truck and the tractor load things that people don't want to get wet onto the truck and the tractor. I've got about 165 head of cattle on this farm. Um, so the very first thing that I want to make sure that gets moved are the, is, are those cows, right? Those cows, um, 
I don't want the cows to uh, go through a flood event, uh, even if they don't drown, uh, even if uh, you know they could pick up disease, it, damage to damage to the herd that way. If you do have an event where you start to lose cattle, clean up on that type of, of level is not very fun. And if you're also trying to put your house back together, figure out where you're going to live and figure out how to take care of people, you don't want to have to be cleaning up uh, deceased livestock. So that's one of the first things that, that we need to know. Hey, there's a high probability of an exceedance event here. Let's get the cows loaded up on trailers and let's move them to another farm that we have in Mississippi, just to make sure that when we get closer to an impact, all of our attention can be focused on uh, more important operations that need to happen, right? And so this is in the same way that we set up SLOs for technology projects, right? We need to know what is the impact to operations for the software, operations for specific teams. When do we need to engage uh, specific parts of our organization to respond to an event? Uh, I'm using you know a similar type of calculation for a very different type of operational uh, strategy. So that's that's all I have. Um, you know, I'm happy to 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 take some questions. Um, you know, happy to happy to talk about this. There's it's a complex subject. Uh, I'm not a professional hydrographer. Uh, I did my graduate work in geospatial.